Well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the University of Washington College of Forest Resources, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our 17th Denman Forest Reissue Series entitled Ecosystem Restoration. We all look forward today to an exciting and informative program as we investigate a series of issues surrounding the restoration of our land and water resources to place them in a more sustainable condition for future generations. This subject is in keeping with the purpose of the Denman Forest Reissue Series, which is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues face, facing our region. As with all the activities associated with an academic setting, our ultimate goal is to inform and educate our students, faculty, and staff, as well as resource professionals, citizen groups, landowners, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the generous support provided by the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources, and they support the college's vision of being a world-class and internationally recognized source of knowledge relevant to environmental and natural resource issues. Before I go into my sustainability introduction, I want to acknowledge the support of two people, Ellen Matheny, who's at our University of Washington Olympic Natural Resources Center in Forks, Washington, uh, handled all of the logistics for today's session, and Bob Edmonds, our Associate Dean for Research at the college, who handled the development of the program. Sustainability uh, is defined uh, in our college as the study that investigates the functionality and the sustainability of complex natural resource and environmental systems in both managed and natural environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales that include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. And in our college, we focus on programs that address sustainable forestry, sustainable urban ecosystems, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the common goal for all of our programs and includes all resources such as timber, horticultural plants, water, wildlife, or insects, for example, considers the needs of future generations as well as those of the present, and strives for a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions with social and economic factors. Today, we wish to focus on a variety of issues related to the restoration of our natural resource ecosystems in Washington State and beyond. Presentations will be organized into two sessions. In session one, we will be presented with three uh, talks that will address an overview of the principles of ecosystem restoration. And in session two, we will look at examples of restoration and community involvement. Now, there are many examples of ecosystem restoration. First, restoration is being done on a variety of different types of land, forest land, range land, mine land, streams, wetlands, urban areas, and other types of, of areas. And restoration is being undertaken by public, private, and Native American organizations. For example, the 29 tribes here in Washington State are engaged in a variety of habitat restoration projects, some involved on the Quinault Reservation involving uh, marine resources, some on the Yakima Reservation involving forest land restoration, and there are many other examples. With us today in session two of our program to present some examples of restoration and community involvement our speakers from the University of Washington College of Forest Resources, the National Park Service, Earth Corps, and Anchor Environmental. Our topic, again, is ecosystem restoration, and I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, Ms. Michelle Connor, who is Vice President of Cascade Land Conservancy here in Seattle, and I'm very proud to say an honored alumnus or alumnae of our college. And so, Michelle, I'd like to turn the program over to you to introduce our first panel of speakers. Our first speaker is Jonathan Bacher. 
John is Assistant Professor of Restoration Ecology in the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Biology and Environmental Studies from Dort College and a Master of Science in Plant Ecology from the University of Regina. In 2005, he received his doctoral degree in Ecosystem Science from Northern Arizona University and joined the University of Washington faculty in 2006. His research focuses on restoration and management of prairies, savannas, and forests, long-term vegetation dynamics, and statistical methods for community ecology. The title of his presentation is Forest Ecosystem Restoration. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for being here. So I'm going to build on the um, examples and the principles that have been discussed already in the first session, and I'm going to um, use some examples of forest ecosystem restoration projects that I've had the opportunity to be involved with to um, illustrate some of those examples for you. Ecosystem restoration, as you've heard and, um, and has been discussed already, is something that's undertaken in response to ecological degradation. And uh, the point that I'm uh, bringing home with the illustrations and the examples I'm using today is that the scope of that restoration depends on a number of factors. Uh, in particular, it in depends on the issues that are being examined, it depends on the resources that are available to the uh, restoration ecologist, and it depends on the scale um, at which that restoration is being undertaken. And to walk through these, I'm going to, um, or to give you an outline for the presentation, I'm going to walk through three different examples of a very different forest ecosystem restoration projects and talk about these, these, uh, the scope um, considerations. The first example is from the southwestern uh, United States. It involves uh, ponderosa pine forests, which are widely distributed um, throughout uh, that side and throughout western North America. There are a number of issues here, but <laughs> when you boil it down, this is really the big issue, um, is that we've got a change in fire regimes. We've gone from a fire regime that was um, beneficial to the ecosystem to something that was bad. It was uh, un unnatural in this particular type of ecosystem. Uh, it was dangerous. People were losing their houses. They were losing, uh, firefighters were losing their lives. There was a lot of um, concern about these fire regimes and the changes that have happened in them. The reason for that uh, change is, is um, long and varied, but ultimately it's it can be distilled into pictures that look like this. We have a, a scene in 1941 in the upper left, and we have the exact same scene in 2003 in the lower right. And you can see that trees grow. Okay, that's, that's the uh, basic premise behind these changes in fire regimes, is that we had no fire because of um, fire exclusion for over a century. Trees grew in that intervening time. They've now created a continuous fuel um, for those fires and are able to support larger um, crown fires that they were not able to support historically. So seeing that pattern as, as the problem that's um, been exhibited here, um, the solution might suggest itself pretty obviously, and that's to remove the trees. So here we have another repeat photo series. This is from, uh, again, the older photos in the upper left and the newer photos in the lower right. But we have a, a site in 1992 and the exact same site in 2004. In the intervening time, restoration treatments were implemented, which involved um, uh, thinning and prescribed fire. And um, so you can see some pretty dramatic responses here in terms of the, the forest overstory, the tree vegetation. Um, we lost a lot of trees. The ones that are left are much healthier than the ones that uh, than they were prior to the treatment. And we also have a very uh, dramatic um, response in the understory vegetation. So all the grasses that you see in the foreground in the lower right picture are um, ones that were present there in 1992, but in much, much, much lower um, amounts. So we see some pretty dramatic responses um, to our restoration treatments here. Um, that understory that I mentioned is also seen here. This is the only data slide in the, in the talk. Um, <laughs> if we track these things over time, we start to see um, trends in how the vegetation is responding. And in terms of the actual amount of, of um, biomass present on the site, um, only th three years after the treatments were implemented, we already were able to detect significant um, increases in the amount of, of biomass. Where we thinned it, which is uh, the circles there that are referred to as the thinning treatment, or where we thinned and burned it, which is what we refer to there as a composite treatment. Um, and those those differences have been maintained over time, 
um, with a lot of interannual fluctuation due to environmental variability. This problem, this issue of changing fire regimes is a very large issue. It's, it's something that uh, really is a west, western Washington or western United States uh, scale of, of an issue. And that allows us to, to also, as we start to implement projects at larger scales, start to look at responses of other organisms. Uh, we can start to look at wildlife responses. Kaibab squirrels, mule deer, um, bluebirds, goshawks, uh, Mexican spotted owls, various other um, organisms are being studied to see how they respond to these treatments. And these types of, of um, considerations can really only be done when you're dealing with large scale um, problems. If you're dealing with a small scale problem, it's not possible to look at uh, something that's smaller than the home range of an organism, for example. It's not possible to really examine how that organism is responding to the restoration treatments. That larger scale is also something that um, is both a benefit and a, and a challenge to this type of restoration. Um, it's enormously expensive to do this type of work. Um, economics, the economics of these restoration projects is actually one of the main limiting factors in terms of um, scaling up to the, to the um, acreages that need to be treated from a um, fire control or fire prevention perspective. Um, and so that becomes one of, the, one of the daunting challenges here is how to pay for the restoration projects that need to, uh, that we need to take place. Uh, there have also been some other interesting social aspects of restoration that have, have come in, that have been incorporated into this. Uh, we have um, in the Southwest very widespread support for this work. Um, basically what it boils down to is folks have realized that they are going to have fire in their forests and they can choose do they want to have it in a prescribed fire where there's some control over it or do they want to let it burn in a crown fire in that bad fire that was in that in the picture you saw earlier so this is one example at a very large scale um, of a restoration project and this this type of work is ongoing throughout uh, the western United States the second example is at a very different scale we're going to now bring it a little closer to home here uh, we're actually this is about a Gary Oak and Douglas fir savanna system on Waldron Island up in this, um, the San Juans. This is a Nature Conservancy um, site. And the primary reason for this restoration project was a concern over the loss of biodiversity. Um, Gary Oak is a, a very important biodiversity element in these systems.